plus rights. The Apologise Now campaign was, let's say, a little bit troubled in its launch because of COVID um, and then the late Queen's death in September last year. We were, of course, supported by Paul O'Grady, who was on stage in the Royal Vauxhall Tavern over two decades ago when the police uh, raided that particular pub with rubber gloves. Now, before Paul died, he did record a video with the Peter Tatchell Foundation, and we'd like to play that video now. We call it Apologise Now, the movie. Then what, I've got a cold, I tell you, my nose is running like a glass full of his heart, I said. And I'd only been in here about 10 minutes, and a copper burst in the dressing room. And I, of course, thought he was a stripper. And he was so rude and so aggressive. And when I came out on the stage there behind me, they were all wearing, the place was heaving, and they were all wearing rubber gloves. And of course, I said, oh, God, if you come to do the washing up, the police raid on the Royal Vauxhall Tavern in 1987 was symptomatic of decades of police witch hunts against the LGBT plus community. They raided our bars, clubs, saunas, even private birthday parties. They arrested same-sex couples for merely kissing, cuddling or holding hands. And I was called a lascivious act, which, to tell you the truth, I was delighted about. We had the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, James Anderson, saying that gay people were, quote, swirling around in a cesspit of their own making. He gave a green light to police persecution of our community. Well, police have apologised all around the world for the behaviour of those years ago, and I think it's about time that the British police did the same thing, and it was just a homophobic act. By 1989, the number of gay and bisexual men convicted of the consenting offence of so-called gross indecency was almost as great as in 1954-55, when male homosexuality was totally illegal. Past injustices often cross my mind, and this has always been one of them. Just the bloody cheek of them. It was, it was disgusting. It was just offensive. You know, we were being treated like animals. Rubber gloves. If the police say they've changed, they need to show it. And showing that they've changed begins with acknowledging the past wrongs. It means the police should apologise. Pure homophobia. That's what it was. So apologise. Because I don't know you Thank you. That, of course, was uh, the late, great Paul O'Grady and Peter Tatch. We're going to hear from Peter in a minute because it's obviously Peter's campaign. But you're probably aware, because we put it on our emails to you, that actually we have had a success in the campaign. The country's biggest police force, one of the biggest police forces in the world, has indeed apologised. And I actually have the apology on my screen. And I'm just going to read to you two paragraphs and then we're going to hear from Paul. The Met has had systems and processes in place which have led to bias and discrimination in the way we have policed London's communities and in the way we have treated our officers and staff over many decades. Recent cases of appalling behaviour by some officers have revealed that there are still racists, misogynists, homophobes and transphobes in the organisation. And we have already doubled down on our rooting out those who corrupt and abuse their position. We are also working hard to deliver a diverse and inclusive workplace where colleagues can feel pride in both the Met and in being themselves. I am clear that there is much for us to do. And here's the key bit. I am sorry to all of the communities we have let down for the failings of the past and look forward to building a new Met for London, one all Londoners can be proud of and in which they can have confidence. Peter, quite an apology very early on in the campaign. Um, were you surprised that the, the Met engaged so quickly with the campaign? I think, Peter, you need to unmute yourself. Literally within just a few days of sending a letter to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, um, James Rawlinson, one of his senior officers in the community engagement team, got in touch. Uh, within two days after that, he was speaking to us on a Zoom call. Um, that really surprised us. 
it was very clear that the police recognised that serious wrongs had taken place, that their officers had often acted abusively, insultingly, threateningly, and sometimes even violently against our community, and that they wanted, particularly in the light of the debacle over the Stephen Port serial killing case, and over the damning Casey report, it's clear they wanted to do something. It's clear they recognised that something had to be done. So getting this apology was, you know, just a matter of just over two and a half weeks, which is pretty much a record. And I think it shows that not just my foundation, but many of us in the community have made our voices clear that policing in the past was not just enforcing the law, but enforcing the law in ways that would today be seen as illegal and unacceptable. And that's why the police have responded. Now, it must be said that the Metropolitan Police are also about to make another very welcome announcement. We're not going to mention it here because we've been told it in confidence, but it is a, another very good step in the right direction and no doubt influenced by this campaign. Now, if anybody has any questions for Peter, please put them in the meeting chat and I will ask him. But Peter, I want to turn the clock back and ask you, why did you launch this campaign? Because it has its roots over many, many decades, doesn't it? It goes right back to the Gay Liberation Front in the early 1970s. One of our core demands was an end to police harassment. And I'll just give you some examples from my own personal experience. A friend of mine was having a birthday party in his flat in Peckham in South London. Homophobic neighbours tipped off the police and between 12 and 15 officers barged in to the flat, forced their way into the flat, knocking people over, shoving them out of the way. One young man was knocked over and bashed his head against the edge of a table, splitting open his forehead. As he fell, he reached out to try and grab something to steady himself, which happened to be the arm of a police officer. He was charged with assaulting the police. <laughs> they had assaulted him, causing that terrible wound, but he got charged with assaulting the police. Another example more recent, in 1991, two lesbians who were giving each other a goodnight kiss and cuddle at the ticket barriers at Victoria train station were arrested by the police. Now, of course, there were no laws against lesbianism, so the police charged them under the Public Order Act 1986, which was introduced to combat football hooliganism and violent street rioting. They used a clause which prohibits behavior likely to cause public harassment, alarm and distress to arrest those two lesbians, take them to court, get them convicted, get them a criminal record and a fine of 60 pounds. I could go on and on and on. I'm sure many of you have stories to tell as well. And that's why an apology is so important. But what's significant is that not only has the Metropolitan Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, apologised, but in his letter, he's also said that he intends to bring forward a new LGBT plus plan for London. So he's backing up his apology with a commitment to action as well. And that is what we desperately need. You know, in the past, I would say there was better liaison between the police and the LGBT plus community 20 and 30 years ago than there has been in the last few years. So Sir Mark does need to put that right. And I'm pretty confident working with him, he will make steps in that direction. I mean, we already know, don't we, Peter, that there is to be another announcement next week, which is a, a small but significant step in that direction. At the House of Lords yesterday, we read out a statement from Charles, who'd been arrested by um, British Transport Police in Liverpool in quite a, a horrific act. And they made him sign a piece of paper that um, if he signed, they wouldn't charge him or release his name to the press. But of course, they did charge him and release his name to the press. And his life has been blighted quite literally for 30 years. This isn't an uncommon theme, is it? That people's lives 
are still being affected by things that happened such a long time ago. Absolutely. We must never forget that after the partial decriminalization of male homosexuality in England and Wales in 1967, police harassment actually got worse. So that by 1974, five years later, the number of gay and bisexual men convicted for consenting victimless behavior was 400% higher than it had been in 1965 and 66, the two years before the partial decriminalization. Uh, by 1989, at the height of the AIDS pandemic and the Thatcher campaign, the moral panic campaign, the family values campaign by the Thatcher government, by 1989, there were nearly 2,000 men convicted uh, or cautioned for the consenting victimless offence of so-called gross indecency. That was almost as great as in 1954 55, when male homosexuality was totally illegal and when the country was gripped by a McCarthyite style homophobic witch hunt. And the final thing I'd just say to, to point out the scale of the witch hunt um, in the years after 1967, until there was full decriminalization in 2003, in the years after 1967, there were three times as many homosexual offences recorded by the police than in the eight decades prior to 1967. So you can clearly see that even after 1967, the police were engaged in a witch hunt against our community. Now, I want to just go to the first question in the chat box from Imran. He's asking why this campaign has any significance at this time when the police is very friendly with the LGBT plus community. Peter, the police march at Pride. Why do they need to do this? Well, of course, the police march at Pride and many people would say they're welcome to march at Pride. But I don't think they should be welcome if they're not willing to apologize for past wrongs. You know, part of the process of healing the divisions and the hurt and the pain, the suffering, is that those who did bad things, like the police, should acknowledge what they did and say sorry. You know, that's a very simple, reasonable thing to do. Now, some people may say it's just a gesture. Well, of course it is a gesture, but gestures are important. Our community has suffered so much at the hands of the police, we deserve an apology. And yes, the police have moved on, but as the Casey report showed, um, the police are still guilty of institutional racism, misogyny, and homophobia. And as we saw in the case of the serial killings by Stephen Port, they badly let down our community. They failed to investigate the first murder properly, which resulted in four young gay men in total, three additional young gay men, being needlessly murdered. You know, there are questions that the police still have to answer. Of course, there are many good officers, that's true, but there are still those who do not serve us well. And, you know, things have improved dramatically compared to the past. And I pay tribute to all of you who've been involved in those campaigns, but we still need to make further progress. Um, also, perhaps to um, add to that, um, Imran, um, we crossed live in the House of Lords yesterday to the Isle of Man, and we heard the most horrific story about an 18-year-old uh, young gay man who, who shot himself. And it is obviously his, his mother is still struggling to live with the events today. Now, the Isle of Man were the first, they're not a British police force, but the first police force in the British Isles to uh, formally apologise for what they did. And we heard from Alan on the Isle of Man that Julian's mother had accepted the apology and it was a great part of her grieving process. Um, I just want to go back to the um, chat box, uh, Peter. Um, Tony said, my life partner, George, who died in 1991, was arrested in a cottage years after the 67 Act. In the police car, he said, but I wasn't doing anything. The policeman said, we know you weren't, but you might have done. Of course, it would have been his word against the police. I think that's a very valid point, Tony. 
Um, Heather, I haven't read this, so just bear with me. I have been speaking directly with the South Yorkshire and PC, uh, South Yorkshire Police and PCC, that's Police and Crime Commissioner. And today, in my role as CEO of Stay It, www.stayit.org.uk, there's a good plug, supporting the call for an apology from them. Thank you very much, Heather. Let me carry on. In the conversations with the Met, was there a key point that they seem to respond to or anything about their motivation tips you could give in having those conversations? I think I'm probably, I'm going to let Peter answer this one, but I think you probably ought to have a chat with Peter. Peter, what do you say to Heather? Well, I think what's been very important about getting the police apology was, of course, the police said quite rightly that they did not make the law. You know, <laughs> the law was not legislated by the police, it was legislated by Parliament. Um, so the police could justifiably say that they were enforcing the law. But we pointed out that is not our beef. Our beef was the way in which the police enforced the law, not the law itself, but the way it was enforced. You know, I personally experienced police officers calling friends of mine, poofters, queers, lezzies, dykes, queers, benders, um, really vile insults. Um, you know, when those police officers said that and they were challenged, um, a couple of my friends were threatened with arrest. Um, to give you another example, um, outside the Colhearn pub in West London, at closing time, even in the 1990s, police would often turn up in squad cars or vans. And as men came out of the pub at closing time and were chatting with each other on the pavement, the police would march over and demand they leave the area. And they'd push and shove them if they didn't quickly move. OK, this campaign, of course, is dedicated to the memory of Paul O'Grady. And I've only ever met Paul once when we recorded that video at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern. He no crime um, quite by standing on the pavement. But he not only got arrested, but he was taken to the local police station and very badly beaten up. And of course, Back in those days, the police were a law unto themselves. They got away with it. There was nothing he could do. OK, I think we, apologies with the sound there. I think we sort of crashed into one another. This campaign, of course, is dedicated to the memory of Paul O'Grady, uh, a great friend and supporter of the PTF, a, indeed a patron. Um, and I met Paul, um, uh, obviously, quite a while before he died. Um, to record the video that we played at the top of this Zoom call. And one thing he said to me, Peter, that's stuck in the memory, we haven't really expanded on it in this campaign, is that so many, he called them the young twinks, if you remember, so many of younger LGBTs don't remember how bad it was. Of course they don't. What lessons and what, what message do you think the whole community should take from this? You know, we have to know about our past in order to understand our present and chart a path to the future. Knowing about what was done to our community by the police in decades past is really important. You know, we do have to educate and inform the younger generations so that they realize just what huge progress has been won. And I'm gonna pay tribute to the literally tens of thousands of LGBT plus people who I've worked with over the years, marched with, protested with, lobbied with, uh, and our straight friends and allies, collectively, we have achieved enormous positive changes. And a lot of people say, well, look, you know, the battle's all over, it's all won. Well, not quite, not quite. You know, we, we still have other issues like a ban on conversion therapy, which was promised five years ago by the Conservative government, and we're still waiting. Um, we still don't have trans self-ID, which, um, we had majority public support for in the consultation, and which has been effectively and very uh, responsibly implemented in 18 countries or regions or states around the world without a problem. So, you know, we've made progress, but more battles need to be fought and won. Peter. We can't really say too much, but we are in negotiations with other forces and it has been positive thus far. At Birmingham Pride, our colleague Pliny, who's uh, sitting, uh, sitting in this Zoom call as well, um, approached the Birmingham Chief Constable and he, well, he'd ignored us and he was, he was polite, but then the letter came from him two or three days later and he isn't going to apologise 
it rather says that you've got a rather lot of work to do so far, doesn't it? It does. I mean, there are certainly police services around the country that are still quite intransigent and where they've got very little history of any proper adequate engagement with local LGBT plus communities. Um, to row back a bit, I mean, I initially confronted the then Chief Constable, Sir David Thompson, the then Chief Constable of West Midlands Police at Birmingham Pride in 2021. Uh, as he marched with his officers, I walked up to him and said, you know, we're really glad you're here, but isn't it about time that you apologised to the LGBT plus community because West Midlands Police were some of the worst in the country uh, in terms of going out of their way to harass and victimise LGBT plus people. So the Chief Constable, he said, well, look, write to me. And I did. I wrote to him um, and pointed out that he had apologised to the black community in 2020 for West Midlands Police's history of racism, uh, and quite rightly too. But he then wrote back to me and said, that may be true, but it's not appropriate for me to apologise for the uh, way in which West Midlands Police treated the LGBT bus community. We were just enforcing the law. So that's their get-go, their, their fallback position. Um, so if you're going to take this up with your local police services around the country, make it very clear we're not disputing the way, the fact that the law existed and that the police enforced the law. We are challenging the way they enforce the law, the extremely excessive, zealous, persecutory and victimising way in which they enforce the law, which went beyond the bounds of what the law said often and sometimes included insults, threats and even physical violence against LGBT plus people. That's the issue. And we really do hope that wherever you are in the country, that you will consider working with local LGBT groups in your area to get your chief constable to apologise, because this isn't just about London. It is a nationwide issue. And if we want to build a really constructive relationship with the police uh, for the future, you know, that apology is a really important part of it. Plus, of course, as with London's Met Police, it needs to be also followed up with an action plan to address LGBT plus concerns in each and every police service and community around the country. Well, I would say to Heather and anybody else who's campaigning in their local areas, perhaps drop me an email and I can put you in touch with pay for, uh, Peter or give you um, some advice. I had a direct message from Thaba. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Um, I think the Met will be announcing more about that next week. So um, it's probably not the right time to do it. Just had a message, Peter, from Anthony. Thank you for this, Peter. I teach criminology at Leeds Beckett and we'll make sure these issues are understood in lectures on LGBTQ issues on our modules. The information on the conviction of the lesbians was very interesting. RT1, hi, Peter and Simon. There are 32 borough commanders in London. What about a Q&A with them and Rowley reading out some of the first-hand recollections of gay people across the decades? I think you made a, a, a very good point, RT1. What I will say is I think um, the mark is fully fully aware of um, what happens. I have to say, Sir Mark wasn't at the House of Lords at our launch yesterday, but he did ring Peter and myself personally um, without staffing it out to, uh, to a, a junie. Um, Tony also added, not forgetting police entrapment by plain coves, pretty police. I've actually been on a call where the Met admitted they did that. They lured gay men to commit a crime, which was anything at all which took place outside one's own home with nobody else present. I mean, I've been quite fortunate. The worst I ever had pizza was at the Napoleon's Bar in Manchester when I was at university and the police raided it and they made us all pour our beer onto the carpet. <laughs> I was very angry about losing my beer, but I just kept thinking about the carpet in this pub for many, many years. Um, pizza, much to do, but the Met is the biggest force in Britain. It's one of the biggest police forces in the world. Um, what message do you think that says to the like of the Chief Constable of West Midlands, West Yorkshire, GMP, Brighton and, and Merseyside and all the others? Yeah, I just add that, you know, we've had no response from the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester. 
which was another great bastion of homophobia. You all remember James Anderson, the raids on gay bars, clubs and saunas. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, gay men in Manchester were arrested for, quote, licentious dancing, i.e. just dancing together in a gay disco got people arrested um, by the Greater Manchester Police. And the fact that Greater Manchester has not engaged with us at all is, you know, pretty contemptible. Um, can I just say that if any of you want to sort of get tips about, you know, how you might approach this with your own local chief constable, if you go on the Peter Tatchell Foundation website, on the home page, there is a full report about yesterday's launch with lots of evidence, arguments, and um, information that you can usefully use. So feel free to take and adapt that. Um, I think going forward, um, what Sir Mark has done is send a signal. He's basically shamed the Chief Constable of West Midlands, who's the only one who said an absolute no. Um, but also, this apology has been reported all around the world. And I think it will embolden um, LGBT activists in many other countries to also seek to get an apology from their chief of police. So it's a great way in which we here in Britain can you know, provide ideas and impetus to heroic LGBT activists in other countries. Now, we also have a campaign website called apologisenow.com. If you haven't signed the petition, please do so. But what you could do to really help us is to publicise apologisenow.com to your friends and on your social media. It's apologisenow.com and the hashtag is apologisenow. So that's um, very easy to remember. You kind of, um, you kind of second guess my next question, Peter. The Chief Constable of West Midlands, the only one to have actually said absolutely not, but the mark is a bit more senior than the Chief Constable of West Midlands, and he's one of the most senior policemen around the world. And this is an example, I think, well beyond these shores, isn't it? Um, now, we've had coverage in Australia, in America, and we were busy translating a Taiwanese website today to see that they were saying very nice things about us. What happens to the campaign now? Well, as I said, we need to roll out this bid for an apology to all police forces across the UK. We need to get apologies from all the chief constables. And for that, we need the support and engagement and collaboration of LGBTs in those different parts of the country. In fact, we'd be very happy for you to take the campaign, make it your own and do it. You don't need, really need us, but we're happy to advise and assist you if you wish. But, you know, you know, whether it be Glasgow or Bristol or Liverpool or Norwich or Brighton or Truro, wherever you are, get those chief constables on your radar and work with others in local LGBT plus groups to put the same issues, the same questions, the same reasonable demand to your chief constable. Thank you. I'm a little bit obsessed by what Melissa's got behind her. It looks like um, it looks like a stained glass window, Melissa. I don't know if it is. It's just a very well lit um, uh, pride flag. But <laughs> I love whatever's behind you, Melissa. Um, Thabba's asked, are you going to push for Sir Mark to accept the MP Metropolitan Police Service are institutionally homophobic and trophobic? To date, he will not accept it. Um, I think he's gone quite a long way, hasn't he? Hasn't he, Peter? Yeah, I mean, he hasn't used that word institutional, but he certainly has made a pretty fulsome apology. And in the apology, he not only apologised to LGBTs, uh, but also to women, Black and Asian people and others. He, he said that, you know, communities right across London have been let down. So that's a pretty important, significant acknowledgement. And of course, we would love to work with women's organisations black community groups and others um, to strengthen that apology and to get the issues of racism and misogyny also dealt with because those are very big issues where the Metropolitan Police has have badly failed. I think in that letter, and um, I will put that letter on to apologisenow.com um, uh, tonight or tomorrow, I think there's possibly a template for 
um, apologies as well, because I think Sir Mark is very much um, opening the door to um, um, clearing house a little and admitting some of the things that's happened in the past. I think we're coming to the end now. Um, um, I'm just trying to work it. Oh, um, thank you, Melissa. It's a photo from Stonewall Anniversary Concert RH. <laughs> thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, you all have my email address because it's on the uh, email that I sent you a link. Can I just plug again? Apologisenow.com is the hashtag and the website is apologisenow.com. Get as many of your friends and your colleagues and relatives to sign that and uh, we'll be in touch about um, sending, uh, sending uh, this. And if you're running a campaign in your own area, just tell us about it. Maybe we can help you. You can certainly embed the Paul O'Grady um, uh, this year. Uh, Jenny, Reclaim Pride is not happening this year. If it is, it's not being organised by us. We've got, um, we've got quite a lot on and uh, the, P the, the PTF is uh, two and a half members of staff. I'm the half, in case you're just wondering. Um, I think that's it. And there's anything you'd like to add, Peter? No, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for this webinar and to thank all of you for the support you give uh, the foundation uh, and for the work you all do, because, uh, you know, I do my bit, you do your bit and collectively and cumulatively together. That's how we make the change. I don't make the change single handedly. My foundation doesn't. Every change we've won for our community has been the result of thousands of people coming together and working often in different ways, but each different way adds up and each different contribution uh, works in different ways to push the levers of social change and reform. So thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm really proud of your commitment and support and uh, want to thank you. You know, you know, I get a lot of death threats and hate mail and so on, but the support you give me is so treasured. It means so much to me. Uh, Jenny, I do think Pride in London will be very busy this year. I've got a few thank yous I want to do. Um, Baroness Helena Kennedy, who hosted us at the House of Lords. A uh, big thanks to her, also a patron of the PTF and a very big advocate for uh, global human rights. George, one of our trustees, is our technical guy today. Couldn't do it without him. Thank you. Uh, I work with um, Pliny and Peter, of course, two great colleagues and I thank them all. Um, I would just like to thank all the subscribers to the PTF Weekly. It's a fantastic publication. We love your responses. We've had more responses than the PTF Weekly in the last 24 hours than we have in the last two years. So thank you all very much. And um, what can I say? We'll have another webinar when we've got something to talk about. But thank you very much. Keep listening. Don't forget, hashtag apologisenow.com. The website is apologisenow.com. Let's uh, let's plug it and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Everybody.